Well, George Knapp will take a look at that as we begin a special series, UFO, the best evidence, question mark, part one is coming up. Have seen an unidentified flying object, yet the subject of UFOs is generally scorned by science, journalism, and the government. An Eyewitness News investigation into the topic that was broadcast last November has drawn worldwide attention, and not all of that attention has been positive. Tonight, George Knapp picks up where our previous series left off. The new series is called UFOs, the Best Evidence, question mark. Gary and Mary Ruth, uh, we've added the question mark for a good reason. There are many unanswered questions about UFOs and about some of the people who claim to have knowledge about the topic, questions about credibility and motives. We'll be taking a hard look at some of those questions this week and beyond. One thing we found is that despite some sniping from other media and the scoffing of government officials, people want to know about UFOs, even some very prominent people. Here, because I know 15 years ago, if you would have said something, especially with the guys I hang around, they would have gone, Right, you know, and uh, when he going to Sparks. Kent Oram is a hard-boiled, semi-cynical public relations man currently running the election campaign of Nevada Governor Bob Miller. A few years ago, Oram says, he and his wife saw something strange in the night sky over Mount Charleston. And we looked at it for about two and a half minutes and it never budged. And at the time, I made a joke to my wife, you know, I mean, if, if you were under the Starship Enterprise, you know, that's sort of what it might look like. Uh, and it was, I would say, it was gigantic and it was more of a square shape, but it was a lot of light. And so I had a pair of binoculars in the uh, back of my Ram Charger, so I went to get them. We finally found them, and then we looked up in the sky, and it was gone. I mean, just flat gone. It depends on who I'm talking to about apprehension. Uh, you know, they, they kind of raise an eyebrow at you, uh, you know. Chuck Woodworth is a 20-year veteran of the Metro Police Department, a trained observer who grew up in the shadow of the Nevada test site. He and four friends saw their UFO in the desert north of Pioche. All we saw was the light. I'm going to tell you, it's the most intense light I've ever seen. And I've been under some, around some pretty heavy lights. I've, uh, if you stood under uh, the uh, police helicopter at night when they're lighting up an area and they come right down, are really saturated with lights, those would be very, very dim to the lights we saw from this distance. I would judge this distance that we observed them uh, to be at least 20 miles, 15 to 20 miles from us. And they were intense. Neither Woodworth nor Oram can identify what they saw, but both believe recent publicity about UFOs has made it easier to openly discuss the subject. There are still those who have reservations, though. Two of Southern Nevada's best-known elected officials say they've seen UFOs, but neither was willing to admit it on television. A veteran Las Vegas attorney sent us this letter saying he once had access to a top-secret military briefing book that included dozens of official photographs of alien beings and alien spacecraft. The attorney did not want his name used. Most people believe that, that uh, UFOs are physically real rather than imaginary. That's what the polls say. But the same, the, the different poll also shows that those same people believe that other people don't believe that UFOs are physically real. No one can say just how many UFOs are sighted each year, primarily because it's difficult to report a sighting. Metro Police won't take UFO reports at all and offer no advice on where to send them. The FAA and McCarran Tower also say they're not interested. And if you call Nellis Air Force Base, as Ruth Ruiz did, this is the response you'll get. And he told me that they're not interested anymore in the UFOs because now we know whoever it is or whatever it is, it's not a threat to us, our national security. Now that's what he told me. Nellis will give you the number of a private UFO hotline located in Seattle. What's more, both Nellis and McCarran spokesmen say they have no memory of even a single UFO sighting over their facilities, a claim that is flatly contradicted by informed sources at both locations. Some UFO sightings are reported to the planetarium, where astronomers can usually come up with a logical explanation. Venus, when it first, you know, uh, a few months ago, when Venus first appeared in our evening sky, yeah, you know, for this time around, uh, you know, we got a number of calls. What's that bright object in the in the sky? Uh, we'll be getting uh, calls on Jupiter pretty soon because it's now rising about midnight in the east. Uh, you know, so we we get those calls mainly it's just curiosity. You know, they they see something strange they hadn't noticed before. Even die-hard UFO believers admit that 90% of all UFO sightings are explainable, but it's the other 10% that are of interest. One good unidentifiable flying object whose characteristics and appearance indicate we're dealing with a vehicle whose behavior says it wasn't made here, is worth 50 cases that you can explain. Just as most drugs don't cure diseases, if you're sick with something, you want the one that does. 
Don't tell me about the ones that don't. So the focus with flying saucers has to be on the evidence, the best evidence from all over the world. Using UFOs and evidence in the same sentence is a sore spot with some media outlets. The Las Vegas Review Journal has taken a dim view of UFO reports. Columnists have cleverly compared the UFO topic to the search for Elvis. Media critics say it's nothing but a ratings ploy. When an international UFO convention was held in Las Vegas, the lone story done by the RJ was a profile of UFO debunker Phil Class, with a headline suggesting it was Class who knew the truth about flying saucers. Later, though, the paper succumbed to UFO fever with a front-page story in its Sunday supplement about UFO sightings in Nelson, Nevada. Uh, their word seems to be, uh, you know, snicker, snicker, and, uh, and make fun of it. But, you know, it's just this uh, attitude uh, that the journalists uh, have got. If they didn't know about it before, it couldn't possibly be true. I mean, they've been sitting on this story now for uh, about two years when I first started out, and there hasn't been one of them that uh, has done any uh, useful research at all. Anyone who takes but one hour to review some of the available evidence cannot come away without the firm conviction that there is something out there not all media have shunned UFOs. Radio talk show host Billy Goodman for months devoted most of his program to the topic, but Goodman's show was canceled by station management. His listeners suspect it's part of a government plot. Station executives say while the show was popular with listeners, it wasn't popular with advertisers. They canceled Goodman, they say, as part of a format change to news and sports programming. Much of Goodman's multi-state audience is now listening to Florida-based talk host Chuck Harder, who's for the People Network is heard on 80 stations coast to coast and frequently focuses on UFO developments in Southern Nevada. Predictably, UFOs remain a staple of the tabloids, which seem to be getting even further out than before. Nazi astronauts return to Earth in surprisingly good health, according to NASA sources. Space aliens stealing our frogs. They must be stopped before it's too late. Remember the psychic who invited aliens to land at a Monday night football game? They never showed up. Not because the Eagles-Bears matchup wasn't appealing, but because the Goodyear blimp scared them away. One weekly tabloid featured a story about Bob Lazar, the young scientist who says he worked at S-4, a secret Nevada military base where the government is allegedly tinkering with flying saucers of alien origin. The article included hyped-up non-quotes and artists' versions of S-4. Lazar has also been featured in UFO magazines. This article demanded that he open up his life for scrutiny by skeptical UFO buffs. Other UFO magazines aren't much different from tabloids. This one awards $10 a month to the person who can rig up the best phony UFO photo. Lazar's story has even made it into Car and Driver magazine. A recent article highlighted a Nevadan named Bob who had built a stealth Corvette for the ostensible purpose of penetrating Groom Lake to capture video of the flying saucers. Lazar's story also caught the attention of at least one television network, Nippon Television of Japan, which sent a crew to Nevada to produce a special about Lazar and Area S4. Uh, you know, he, quite, he seemed to be quite an interesting guy. You know, he knew what he was saying. He's not another fruitcake, you know, who just came out and just wanted to tell all the story. So we, we did some backup check, and there seemed to be some truth. Lee and his crew have produced 17 one-hour programs about UFOs for national broadcast in Japan. He says he can't understand why American networks avoid the topic. For the report on Lazar, Nippon set aside two full hours on a Saturday night. I don't know about here, but in Japan, to our special in the Saturday evening from 7 to 9, it's, you know, it's a hell of a, you know, spot there. There are more than a few people who consider the public fascination with UFOs to be downright dangerous. Aviation writer Phil Class says the belief in alien beings and a government cover-up is, quote, potentially as dangerous as Jonestown. That's the jungle settlement where dozens of people willingly committed suicide. A study by two psychologists concluded that persons obsessed with UFOs, especially cigar-shaped flying saucers or rounded discs, are victims of a familiar Freudian syndrome. If an interest in UFOs is a sign of mental aberration, then count the U.S. government as being among the disturbed. Bob Lazar, of course, can recite a litany of strange things he says have happened to him. Tapped phones, break-ins, threats. But even if you don't buy his story, there are others who can attest to a government interest in UFO adherence. 
Terry Tavernetti is the former police officer who performed polygraph tests on Lazar. Tavernetti, who has a corporate security job with a major Las Vegas business, says that shortly after his involvement with the Lazar probe was made public, his employers were contacted. If the corporate offices, where I'm employed, received a telephone call from a government agency wanting to know why I was getting involved in something that uh, I shouldn't be. And I asked, well, what agency, what was said, did they identify themselves? And I said, because I'll be more than happy to talk to them. Uh, and I was refused this information, told that uh, he didn't know, meaning my boss. Tavernetti, who still retains the tapes and printouts from Lazar's polygraphs, also says his home was burglarized in early January. As an investigator of over 20 years, I don't believe in coincidences. There's a right reason for everything. Uh, I mean, could it have been a random residential burglary? Uh, yes. A Las Vegas man named Roy Byram contacted us back in November 1989, saying he had information about Area 51 that he had gleaned by preparing tax returns for several people who worked at Groom Lake. Less than 24 hours after phoning us, Byram says, he was visited by two men claiming to be Secret Service agents who, quote, just wanted to lean on me a bit. Journalists who've studied the field for many years say that government interest in persons with inside information about UFOs is very real. A body of information about UFOs in the possession of our government, which is so sensitive to the people in custody of it, that they will do just about anything to protect it. Finally, there's this item. A Las Vegas resident currently working for local government told us she previously worked for a defense contractor and was privy to numerous high-level discussions about crashed disks, recovered bodies, and alien technology. She was going to provide us with some of this information, but less than two weeks ago says she was visited at her home by a man identifying himself as a government agent. The man said that any release of information would lead to trouble, adding that our source does a lot of traveling and that, quote, accidents can happen. The agent also mentioned that harm could come to the woman's family. She has now declined to talk with us. And you know, Gary and Mary Ruth, people watch uh, reports like this at home, and I think some view, view it with interest, but they view it as in the same way they're interested in a movie of the week. This is not a movie of the week. Others uh, seem to believe, particularly our media critics, like we're making this stuff up, and we're not making it up. We've spent almost a year on, on this investigation, and uh, there's a definitely a body of information out there that, that, that deserves an investigation. No, but proprietors Joe and Pat Travis have few complaints. They're expanding now into a second trailer, thanks to the patronage of a few dozen locals and a steady stream of UFO buffs drawn by reports of flying discs on the other side of the Groom Mountains. I, I think most people that come up here come up for the enjoyment just to get away from the hassles and uh, the city, just to get out and to do something different. And this is uh, something different to do, yeah. UFOs have become so synonymous with Rachel that a flying saucer was included on posters advertising the annual town celebration. Likenesses of ETs adorn the walls of the bar, and Joe Travis is even talking about renaming the place. The Alien. Yeah, the yeah, Alien. You know, we're gonna have we're gonna have real nice drinks. You know, like the Transporter. Uh, you know, beam me up. You know, like that. It may be self-serving, but the Travises insist that plenty of folks actually see the flying saucers. On any given night, numerous headlights slice through the darkness outside Area 51. The curious are routinely monitored by omnipresent security forces, both in the desert and in the bar. If there are any that are kind of acting a little bit strange, I know about it, and so do they. You mean the people over there come over here to see if people are still coming up here? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. If Rachel was big enough to have a mayor, Bob Lazar could probably be elected. His statements about government activities inside the test range are largely responsible for the influx of visitors. Lazar says he was hired by the United States Navy to work in an ultra-secret facility dubbed S-4, approximately 10 miles south of Area 51. S-4 sits adjacent to the dry bed of Papoose Lake, Lazar says, and is built to blend in with the desert. According to Lazar, S-4 is home to at least nine flying disks of alien origin. The craft are powered by antimatter reactors, propelled by anti-gravity generators. The fuel is a heavy element called 115, he says, and the mission of those who work at S-4 is to master and duplicate the alien technology using Earth materials and know-how. 
He believes the technology is extraterrestrial for several reasons. One, because the machines do things that are beyond Earth technology. Two, because of the telltale small furniture inside the flying disks. And three, because of briefing papers he says he read at S4. There were autopsy reports. I mean, I didn't look, completely read them, uh, because I didn't have time, and as soon as I got into some interesting things, I wanted to get through these really quickly, because I know I didn't have much time. Uh, basically, I looked at the pictures in them, to save time. <laughs> and there were pictures of what? The dead aliens. I mean, how do you know they're aliens? What, what do they look like? The, uh, I guess the typical gray, if anyone knows what that is, the three and a half, four foot tall, uh, smooth head, large, smooth, large head, uh, what they had, they had uh, their organs laying out or what? Yeah, their organs. Some of them, the organs were bisected, taken apart. There were drawings associated with the organs. Uh, the bodies were all cut up. I didn't see a picture of uh, a live, seemed like well-being. Barring a full confession by the government, which seems highly unlikely, it may be near impossible to prove what Lazar says. It's tough enough proving anything about him. The schools he says he attended say they still have no records of his enrollment. Los Alamos National Lab, where he says he was employed as a physicist, has consistently denied that Lazar ever worked there. When Los Alamos was confronted with a 1982 lab phone book containing Lazar's name, officials came up with a different story. They now say Lazar worked briefly for a lab subcontractor in a non-sensitive position. After numerous inquiries over several months, however, neither the lab nor the subcontractor have provided copies of Lazar's records. Interviews with Lazar's former co-workers confirmed that he did work on sensitive projects, including SDI research involving this massive particle accelerator. If so, he must have had a security clearance, but trying to track that down has also proved difficult, even with the help of Nevada Congressman Jim Bilbray. For months, Bill Bray's office has been playing postal patty cake with several government agencies concerning Lazar's records. Bill Bray's staff has written letter after letter to the Navy, CIA, FBI, and other agencies requesting files on Lazar. The agencies aren't saying they have no such files. They say they can't find them or are still looking. The FBI, the world's greatest detective agency, has spent almost five months searching its own records, but is still looking for Lazar's file. Lazar insists he was investigated by the FBI, not only for his Los Alamos clearance, but also for his work at S4. It, at one time, three came to the house. One sat me down, started talking to me while the others kind of ran around the house doing things. I have a little lab in the house, and they wrote down everything. I was on the blackboard. They wrote down any chemicals and things that I had in, in the room. Uh, and just kind of ran all over the place. Lazar says he wrote down the name of one of the agents, Mike Thigpen. The Las Vegas FBI office says no Mike Thigpen has ever worked here. However, an informed source at the FBI says Thigpen was here for a period, that he worked for a separate division of the Bureau, came in, did a job, and left. What that job was, the source didn't know. Lazar is as much to blame as anyone for the difficulties in proving his story. He is admittedly careless when it comes to paperwork, like some absent-minded professor. When his first wife died more than five years ago, he says he walked away from everything, a house full of furniture, pictures, papers. In addition, he's done things in his life that do not help his credibility. For a time, he designed and raced incredibly powerful jet cars. He hung out with rock stars and helped produce record albums. And he and his first wife had an interest in a legal brothel. That interest eventually led to some work he did for a small bordello in a residential Las Vegas neighborhood. When you add it all up, Lazar says he's an easy target to discredit. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of, you know, odd things that I've been involved with over the time, just because I have a, a wide variety of interests. Uh, a lot of it can be misconstrued and, you know, taken out of context, and uh, I'm sure it can be used to make me look, look pretty bad. And, you know, there again, maybe that's one of the reasons uh, they looked at before hiring me. I'm an easy person to, to hammer into the ground. You know, you can take uh, any one of a million things. And, most people, Lazar says, have been very supportive of his decision to come forward. And then there's the UFO community. Lazar's testimony hit the UFO field like a tidal wave. For instance, this is an international computer network called Paranet. More than 20,000 people from all over the world are hooked into the system, and Bob Lazar is one of their favorite topics. They share information about his background, debate his allegations, and theorize about his motives. And actually, there was, uh, there was 
international coverage of what was going on here the very first day, you know, after the special was run. What we're really pressing for and what we're watching for is more empirical evidence that we can, that we can work with. One item that popped up on Paranet is this supposedly official briefing dated February 1990 that states Lazar did work on the test range, but that he was never allowed inside the, quote, advanced systems test area. The statement says Lazar is merely out for media attention and that all further inquiries should be handled by Nellis Public Affairs. Nellis officials told us that the briefing wasn't written by the Air Force and that they have no information on Lazar. Various UFO experts have also been beating a path to Las Vegas to talk with Lazar. Dr. Jacques Vallée, an astrophysicist, computer scientist, and author, wanted to find out for himself if Lazar is believable. He seems very credible. I think that he was in the places that he described. Uh, he also seemed to have concern with remembering parts of the things that went, went on there. Uh, he seemed to, uh, if you remember, we asked him if, if he felt that his memory might have been tempered with. Uh, now that is, is something that I think should be of concern as we explore his story. Could it be that he was exposed deliberately to certain things, uh, perhaps to distract attention from, from other things? And, uh, but. I, I'm certainly of the opinion that he's not lying, that he's telling the truth, and that he's genuinely concerned with uh, finding out what happened to him. Vallée believes it is possible that Lazar's memory was tampered with, adding that U.S. intelligence agencies have been experimenting with mind control techniques, including drugs and brainwashing, for decades. Lazar has stated previously that he was drugged and subjected to intense intimidation tactics. Vallée's statements are also consistent with the results of Lazar's polygraph tests. My personal thoughts, the pre-test interview of three and a half hours, the test itself, the post-test interview, showed absolutely nothing to detour my thought that Bob Lazar was truthful. Unfortunately, we're dealing with a subject matter here to where fear on uh, behalf of Mr. Lazar of reprisal might far exceed uh, just the threat of losing his credibility as a scientist, which would make polygraph maybe totally ineffective. 私たちを出迎えてくれたラザー博士は取材官は早速この番組のプロデューサー、ジョージ・ナップ氏に会見した。Lazar was credible enough for the Nippon TV network. Nippon devoted two hours of prime time to a special on Lazar and UFOs in March. The network planned to fly Lazar to Japan so he could appear live following the documentary. But those plans fell through when Lazar received a phone call from his ex-boss at S4. The day we were supposed to go, I had tickets in hand, even went down and bought yen down at the uh, uh, currency exchange. Uh, you know, we got threatening phone calls, I mean, that, that basically said, you'll never make it back here. So we really sat down and just thought, how important really is the interview, and we didn't go. And frankly, they don't operate like that. How do they operate? I mean, what... Uh, they tend to feed uh, information into the system through people that they know will repeat it, without questioning it. Bill Moore is something of an expert on the government's anti-UFO tactics, and he's clearly skeptical about Lazar's story. He thinks Lazar may be part of a government disinformation campaign, either willingly or unwittingly. Moore's suspicions have been heightened by Lazar's unwillingness to open up parts of his private life to public scrutiny. Lazar says he doesn't care whether UFO people believe him or not, and that he doesn't want to have his background picked apart. Even though he's done things in private that might seem strange, he says he stands by his original statement. The, the job I had, the involvement with uh, you know, the government cover-up, that sort of thing, the story isn't altered in, uh, in any way. I mean, that stands as fact, and that's the bottom line. Is government disinformation for real? Is there an S-4? Is there a connection between UFOs and stealth technology? More on these topics tomorrow. George Knapp, Eyewitness News 8. Healthwise station atop Angel Peak can pick out aircraft for 500 miles. For the most part, it detects commercial craft, big airliners traveling at certain speeds. On occasion, military craft will jam the station's sensors as part of training exercises. And once in a great while, the big radar will pick up signals from something strange, something that apparently just hovers over the Groom Mountain area. It mostly stays put. Uh, it doesn't... Uh doesn't move in range or azimuth very much and uses a stationary code that we normally use for a test function.
The sightings sometimes last for up to 15 minutes. Barnes says it could be an advanced helicopter, but he doubts it. So what is it that floats above the most top secret location in the world? Finding out isn't easy. The Groom Mountain location, also known as Area 51, is shut off from the world by a combination of desolation, motion detectors, laser sensors, and a highly mobile force of large, ominous security personnel. Men who are, according to informed sources, culled from the ranks of veteran Green Berets, Navy SEALs, and police agencies, and are supposedly trained by America's elite Delta Force. So what's the big secret at Area 51? It's likely there are more than one, but the biggest may be the one Bob Lazar says he worked on. Lazar says he worked a few miles south of Groom at a place called S-4, and that this is where our government is trying to master at least nine flying disks of alien origin. The hangars are all connected together, and there are large bay doors between each one. And uh, there were nine total that I saw, each one being different. Lazar is the first person to publicly proclaim first-hand knowledge of the S-4 saucers, but stories about alien technology being tested in Nevada have been whispered for years. The government generally dismisses such reports outright, much as U.S. Senator Harry Reid did in this letter to a constituent. And if a denial isn't enough, there's always laughter, such as occurred during dedication ceremonies for EG&G's new facility at Nellis. What is it that they do over there? Well, I've tried to tell them that that's where Nick keeps the space people from Groom Lake. <laughs> and during the week, he lets them out and they do root canals for us in our hospital clinic. <laughs> Jim Goodall, for one, doesn't think the story is all that funny. Goodall is one of the best-known aviation writers and photographers in the world and has written what may be the definitive book on stealth technology. He did it by cajoling information out of a network of aerospace and military sources. Goodall was skeptical about UFOs in the beginning, but his attitude changed during his stalking of the stealth fighter an engineer employed at Lockheed Aircraft's so-called Skunk Works operation, which tests many of its advanced machines at Area 51, told Goodall that the UFO stories are true. He looked at me and says, absolutely, positively, without a doubt, they exist. I mean, it, 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 sort, of, it sort of startled me, and I said, I said, what do you mean? He says, well, we have stuff in the Nevada desert that would make George Lucas envious. Goodall pursued it further. A civilian who worked on various projects at Groom Lake over a 10-year period had much the same story. He sort of hemmed and hawed, and, and, he, and he sort of stepped back and said, you know, we have stuff out there that, that anything, in, in essence, anything you've seen on, on Star Trek, this is really before Star Wars came out, so anything you've seen, you've seen Captain Kirk do or what he, what he has, so we far exceed his capability. But does this mean the technology is extraterrestrial? Goodall put that question to a third source, a master sergeant who says he did three tours of duty at Groom. So the United States government and the military has things that are out there, you can't describe them as airplanes, that are literally out of this world. They are, and he, and he emphasizes out of this world. He says, and they're alien to, to anything that you've ever seen. And, he says, and I, I try to press him for some more, and he says, he says, I can't comment. He says, I've gone much farther than I should have already. In addition to Goodall's research, there is at least circumstantial confirmation for some parts of Bob Lazar's account. For one thing, there really is a place called S-4 on the Nellis Range. That, according to Nellis Public Affairs Captain Jeff Milkey. Milkey told us the military operates certain equipment at S-4, but he wouldn't say exactly where it's located or what equipment is tested there. Lazar says he and other personnel would muster at eg and g and would then be flown to Groom Lake aboard planes much like these photographed outside EG&G's Nellis facility. Once at Groom Lake, Lazar says, he would ride a bus down a long dirt road to S-4, adjacent to Papoose Lake. The latest maps of that area show a long dirt road leading from Groom to Papoose. What the map doesn't show is the type of activity underway at Papoose. If there really are flying saucers there, it's conceivable that some of the technology may have found its way into Earth contraptions. For instance, the stealth. There are more than a few similarities between stealth technology and some characteristics ascribed to UFOs, which is why some people suspect that both types of vehicles have been nurtured and tested in the same corner of the Nevada desert. There is no question that stealth has been put through its paces in and around the Nellis Range in Area 51. If there's any person outside the government who might also know about the testing of UFOs or a connection to stealth, 
It's this man, Ben Rich, the brains behind such aviation marvels as the U-2, the SR-71 Blackbird, and the Stealth Fighter. Rich is the longtime boss of the Skunk Works, Lockheed's Advanced Systems Division. When asked about a possible link between stealth and aliens, he didn't bat an eye. Some people say it's uh, alien technology. No, it isn't. It's just good American ingenuity. It takes a lot of hard, lots of good people working together. And then the cooperation of the Air Force. We couldn't have done it with the cooperation of the Air Force. They kept the minimum amount of people knowledgeable about it, and we did it in the black. But this denial doesn't tell the whole story when it comes to Ben Rich and UFOs. Rich has confided to close associates that he is a, quote, believer. This letter from Rich to a longtime friend confirms this belief. A follow-up letter from the friend asked for a clarification whether Rich might be talking about man-made or extraterrestrial UFOs. Rich responded saying he believes in both, but added there are kooks and charlatans associated with each category. Jim Goodall, who has known Ben Rich for 15 years, admits that he too has seen the letters and thinks Rich is sending us all a pretty strong hint. If anyone outside of the select group of people within the military, Department of Defense, who would know about uh, alien spacecraft, the hardware portion of it, if anyone in the world would know about it, it would be that gentleman. Was President Jimmy Carter also privy to information about UFOs on the Nellis Range? That's what this alleged presidential briefing document suggests. The so-called Aquarius document was obtained in 1983 by journalist Bill Moore. Moore says government agents allowed him to photograph Aquarius in a hotel room. But the photos aren't that clear, and neither are photostatted copies. A retyped version of the alleged presidential paper purports that the U.S. military has been in contact with aliens since 1964 and that an effort to test fly alien aircraft has been underway in a misspelled Nevada since 1972 under the code name Project Snowbird. Bill Moore says even he isn't convinced that Snowbird is real, and even if it is, it doesn't mean saucers are flying at Groom or Papoose Lakes. In order to divert the attention away from what's really going on up there, it might serve the, the purposes of those responsible for diverting attention to spread stories about UFOs and alien technology in that area. If someone really did try to divert attention away from Groom Lake by spreading UFO stories, they made a big mistake. Just ask any of the city folk who routinely drive up to sit outside the base and watch. More importantly, Moore's suggestion that someone official might be spreading false information about UFOs must seem supremely ironic in certain circles. That's because Moore is considered by some to be the reigning expert on disinformation. At a 1989 UFO convention, Moore admitted he participated in a scheme to feed bogus information to a fellow UFO researcher. With Moore's acquiescence, government agents convinced a researcher that space aliens had built a secret underground base at Dulce, New Mexico. Moore says he has a good reason for allowing a fellow researcher to be bamboozled. My involvement was only with the motive of learning how the process worked, who was involved with it, and ultimately, if I could, what was behind it? Why is the government doing this kind of thing? I never did quite learn why, but I did learn who, and I learned a great deal about how. Many people in the UFO field aren't buying it. They say Moore was taken in by his own government sources. UFO magazine called Moore's actions malevolent. Moore counters he did ufology a favor by proving once and for all the government really is spreading disinformation. In essence, what I was doing was rubbing the noses of the UFO community in what's going on all around them all the time and saying, hey, fellas, wake up. You're being had, you're being used, and you better be aware of it. Uh, because it's, it's gotten to the point where it's beginning to influence what people think about this subject. Yeah. Well, a lot of them didn't like that. A lot of them didn't like it in spades. What does this say about the validity of the Snowbird document? Lee Graham would certainly like to know. Graham is a California aerospace worker who forwarded Snowbird to the U.S. government to find out if it's real. What he got instead was an ongoing investigation of his own UFO activities. One of the agents sent in to check Graham out is a Mike Majewitz, who according to documents filed with the Justice Department, told Graham that Snowbird was not only real, but had been declassified. If it's declassified, Graham says, why is he still under investigation? 
investigation. The Pentagon won't tell him, nor would it tell us, and we were not allowed to talk to Mike Majewitz. But is Snowbird real? Has it been declassified? Dale Hardick, a media liaison for the Pentagon, told us he didn't know, and he had no idea where to go to find out. If all of this seems complicated and confusing, then welcome to the world of government disinformation. And there's a lot more where this came from. Well, sometimes uh, when you deceive the public, you're, you're protecting the public. Uh, and I certainly would protect the public in, de in deception operations if it, it was for their own good. Is the so-called Falcon another source of disinformation, or is he for real? More on that tomorrow. George Knapp, Eyewitness News 8. 1989 was the taping of a conversation that allegedly took place between space shuttle pilot John Blaha and NASA concerning an alien spacecraft. Uh, Houston, uh, this is Discovery. We still have the alien spacecraft uh, under observance. Was this actually the voice of Blaha talking about a UFO? People wondered. Voice comparisons were made to find out. Uh, Houston, uh, this is Discovery. We still have the alien spacecraft uh, under observance. It's a shame we can't be here uh, all the time with a permanent manned space station. We ought to get in that direction. The man largely responsible for publicizing the alleged Blaha tape was Bob Exler, a former NASA mission specialist. But that was 1989. This year, Exler says it was all a hoax, and the government did it. There's a, an experimental transmission facility by the Air Force in the geographic location of the origin of the transmission. The National Security Agency is located within that area. Uh, it's a hoax of unknown origin, but this, there's room for speculation. It just is too good a hoax for someone to just contrive and come up with. Exler and others suspect that distortion and disinformation are the government's primary tools for dealing with the UFO topic. Journalist Bill Moore can recite a long list of examples of how the government has spoon-fed bogus UFO information to gullible researchers. Moore admits he even played a role in one such scheme. Moore alleges the official lying dates back to the 1940s, when the Air Force began studying UFO cases. Eighty percent remained unexplained in 1949. Yet they were telling the public at that time, in public press releases dated the same month, that only 10% remained unexplained. Flat out lie to the press. At the time, the press couldn't say, say different, but now, uh, 40 years later, with freedom of information and access to that document, it's clear they lied to the press. Why did they do that? And all the way through, you can trace a deliberate pattern of disinformation, deception, uh, the laughter curtain, the ridicule, the debunking, uh, the UFO bashers that came out, uh, come out, there's still a few of them around, and say that anybody involved with UFOs is, is, is a crackpot. Anyone who knows UFOs knows the brilliant but arrogant Bill Moore. His fingerprints are all over the foremost cases and questions in ufology. He and Stan Friedman are primarily responsible for painstakingly documenting the Roswell incident, the apparent crash of a UFO in New Mexico in 1947, which is perhaps the best documented UFO case of all. The so-called MJ-12 documents, which allege that a secret panel of scientists and military men are in control of a UFO cover-up, first surfaced in an anonymous mailing to Moore's close friend, film producer Jamie Chanderay. The UFO community is deeply divided over the legitimacy of the MJ-12 papers. Even more controversial, though, is Moore's reliance on an informed source codenamed Falcon. The entire historical aspects from, from day one, uh, from the uh, first sighting uh, near Mount Rainier uh, to uh, recently, I think within the last five years, is contained in uh, a large book that we refer in within the intelligence community as a Bible. Can you give me a physical description of these aliens? A creature about uh, three foot four to three foot eight inches tall. Their eyes are extremely large, almost insect style. Uh, their eyes have a couple of different inner lids, and that's probably because they were born on a planet that had a sun, a binary sun. The, uh, the days were extremely bright. They had no teeth as we know it. They have a hard gum-like uh, area. Uh, their internal organs are quite simple. They have a, a one organ which encompasses what we would refer to as a heart, heart and lungs.
It's one pulmonary sac. Their brain is more complex than ours. It has a, uh, several different lobes than ours have. Uh, their hearing is quite better than ours, almost better than the dog's small areas, uh, the side of their heads. And uh, their sexual organs are, they have males and females. And if the female uh, has the sexual organs similar to ours, similar to our, our females, they don't require very much liquid. They transfer all the, the food that they eat into, into, into liquids. They extract the liquid. Their body extracts the liquids out of the, of the food. So they don't require a lot of liquids. But they have been able to eat uh, some basic food products, vegetables and fruits uh, that we would eat. But I, I believe they're, they have problems digesting uh, meat products, our meat products, and I don't believe that they eat meat on their planet. Falcon is one of a dozen alleged intelligence operatives who've been funneling information to Moore and Chanderay. The other sources have also been assigned bird-like code names, including Condor and Hawk. Falcon in particular has vocalized support for many of the same UFO positions defended by Moore, namely the existence of MJ-12, the legitimacy of the Aquarius document, which alleges that flying saucers are being tested in Nevada, and the reported plot to withhold UFO information from the public. Moore and Chanderay have, for the first time, produced a videotape for mass distribution, sort of Falcon's greatest hits. Our job out there in the field was to investigate sightings, uh, landings, or contacts with UFOs or UFOs extraterrestrials in a way that we wouldn't draw attention to the public. So we had to do our investigation through a covert means. And that's why we were disguised uh, or under cover of military or other federal agencies when we were investigating these UFO sightings. We run it just like we would run an intelligence operation. We would uh, solicit either witting or unwittingly. Uh, we uh, recruit these people just as uh, an intelligence officer would recruit an agent in a foreign country to provide us information on these sightings. We've used uh, uh, newspaper uh, personnel uh, wittingly and unwittingly, and we've used uh, scientists, or we have posed as scientists. Well, sometimes uh, when you deceive the public, you're, you're protecting the public. Uh, and I certainly would protect the public in, de in deception operations if it, it was for their own good. But uh, some aspects of this UFO uh, investigations that have occurred over the years have no reason to be held withheld from the public. The general knowledge that, that there were aliens that landed on Earth uh, back in the early 50s, late 40s, early 50s, and that we have had some type of crude uh, communications with them since. Moore and Chanderay say they have independent confirmation that Falcon is or was an intelligence operative, but even some of Moore's closest contemporaries have reservations about the material. This whole business about Condor and Falcon and guys putting out documents with false statements in them, I've seen some and I've tried to stay away from it. I try to work with something I can get my mitts into. I'm convinced, for example, that Falcon and Condor, the alleged agents who spoke on the UFO cover-up live program in October 1988 were embroidering a lot of the information they gave out. I'm absolutely convinced that some of that was disinformation, but the important thing is that they are confirming that there has been contact. Contact has, has been established. Moore's UFO enemies are less complimentary. They think Falcon and Condor are trying to use them as pigeons. There's a widespread assumption that Falcon is a former Air Force intelligence officer named Richard C. Doty, who is infamous in UFO circles for gleefully misleading researchers. Some have alleged that Moore is either an agent himself or is at least on the disinformation payroll. Still others say Moore is just out to make money, whether on Falcon tapes or MJ-12 documents. If, if I were out to get rich to make money on this thing, I'd have done that five years ago when we got the MJ-12 documents. I'd have sold them to the National Enquirer. In fact, they wanted to buy them. I wouldn't sell them. I had two publishers approach me, want to do the story. I turned them down. We don't know about this stuff. Until we know something about this material, there isn't a story here. So it's not money. What I'm out to do is find out what the bottom line is and how it will influence man's future. I think it's high time somebody rubbed 
the human race's nose in its own excrement and said, hey folks, to an alien, this is what you look like. This is what you're doing to your planet. As difficult as it may sound to us, they are so far advanced and that they can't uh, communicate with us like we can communicate with each other on this planet. And I believe it's uh, partly because of uh, them being scared, scared of us as, as a different type of uh, creature. If there are aliens, it's no wonder they're scared of us, considering how some humans have reacted to the prospect of their presence. Tomorrow, a look at how UFOs have become convenient vehicles for conspiracy buffs and right-wing zealots. George Knapp, Eyewitness News 8. UFO picture almost from the beginning. Con men have used the subject for their own ends many times. Lately, though, there's a new twist. Some UFO believers are using the ET phenomena as a means of whipping up public hysteria. They wrap themselves in the American flag, mix in a little old-time religion, and laugh all the way to the bank. As we'll see in tonight's report, some scientists believe there is a real body of data concerning UFOs. The question is, how will that data be used? There are people who must have people in Washington and elsewhere must have a building full of data that I think the scientific community should have. Data that comes from radar, from sensors on Earth, from sensors in the ocean, and from sensors in space. Those sensors have been deployed for other reasons, for reconnaissance, for intelligence, for guidance, for communications, and so on. And those sensors are all over the place. And they must pick up the UFO phenomenon, because we know the, the energy constraints and the boundaries of the UFO phenomenon, it has to trigger those sensors. We know it does. So somebody has all that data. Jacques Vallée is something of an anomaly, a solid scientist who thinks UFOs deserve to be studied. Vallée was the real-life model for the French scientist character in the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. His books were among the first in the field to express concern that intelligence agencies might be spying on UFO groups. He was also among the first to notice that some of those who were preaching the UFO gospel were pursuing their own political agendas, using flying saucers to attract attention to other causes. One explanation is that it's simply, there are people in society who have extreme beliefs of one kind or another and that they gravitate towards extreme beliefs about UFOs and aliens and, uh, and bases in, uh, you know, on Earth and so on, just as well as in politics, they gravitate to extreme beliefs. Today's ET extremists out-tabloid the tabloids. These aliens aren't merely here to rape our women or steal our frogs. They want it all. It's just that instead of the Illuminati, the trilateralists, the Bilderbergers, the Rothschilds, the world bankers, uh, and on and on and on, uh, being uh, in a plot to take over the planet and, and uh, enslave the world and make a fortune in the process. Now it's the aliens who are overseeing the whole process and they're doing it. The most vocal of today's cosmic doomsayers is Bill Cooper, a former Navy petty officer who says he read and copied top secret military documents which outline an incredibly complex plot involving international bankers, industrialists, politicians, drug cartels, the CIA, and of course the aliens. Cooper's first televised unveiling of this grand conspiracy came in a 1989 appearance with John Lear on the talk program On the Record. We are in possession of uh, alien technology, which we have actually, uh, in effect, traded human lives and property for. Uh, there is a formal treaty, which is illegal under the Constitution with this alien nation. Um, uh, everything about it is illegal, and, and to tell you the truth, in my estimation, just stinks rotten. Um, like John, after uh, this MUFON conference is over, I think I'm going to get out of this too. But he didn't get out of it. Instead, he jumped into it with both feet. Cooper soon became the featured speaker at UFO lectures all over the West. A January 1989 appearance at the Showboat Hotel in Las Vegas drew 700 people at $10 a head, or $15 at the door. This promotional material proclaimed Petty Officer Cooper to be the nation's foremost expert on UFOs. Who's responsible for this designation? It seems that people in listening to what I have to say and what others have to say have made their own determination on that fact. Never uh, at any point have I ever made such a statement. As the audiences grew, so did the story. Cooper's thesis, titled The Secret Government, grew from a modest five pages in January 1989 to a much heftier 28 pages by May of 1989. In the earlier version, Cooper pledged that this was it. There would be no additions or corrections. He swore 
part of the statement. I swear that this information is true, all true. Two weeks later, he changed the story and swore that was true. And then he changed it again and swore that was true. Then he started uh, suddenly assimilating information which he got from other researchers and other individuals and incorporating that into his story and claiming that it was part of the material that he had seen in 1972. According to the Cooper scenario, humans have had a base on the moon since the 1950s, another on Mars since the 1960s. We've recovered dozens of crashed disks and scores of alien bodies. The aliens are here to use us for food and genetic experiments, including mass sterilization, which is why we must hang on to our guns and oppose birth control. George Bush is in on it, so is Henry Kissinger, the Vatican, and most of the nation's leading scientists. John Kennedy was assassinated because he was going to blow the whistle on the drugs and saucers connection. Bill Moore, Stan Friedman, Philip Klass, John Lear, Bob Lazar, and anyone else who questions Cooper's credibility have been written off as agents of MJ-12 and thus part of the plot. So what's the motive? Get rich quick, where he's making thousands and thousands of dollars going around the country. He was in Atlanta last week. Uh, and charged fifty dollars a plate for people to have dinner with him so they could ask him questions you know the man is in my opinion based on the research that i've done about him and i don't mind saying this on camera let him sue if he wants to challenge it. i'd love to have him in court in my opinion he's a total phony total phony well let me ask you how much money do you make in what you do and how much do you expect to make i don't think it's anybody's business but my own Cooper insists his information came from reports he read in 1972. Moore points out some of the documents included in Cooper's thesis contain entries from 1974, 75, and beyond, and thus couldn't have been read by anyone in 72. When I first met him a couple years ago, he said he could vouch for 50% of what I was saying. Since then, Bill apparently can vouch for 150% of what I'm saying. John Lear was instrumental in bringing Cooper out of the UFO closet, but even Lear now questions Cooper's claims. In 1988, Lear helped an acquaintance compile and write a UFO paper under a pseudonym, O.H. Krill. The name is an inside UFO joke. Krill is supposedly the name of the first alien to communicate with humans. The O.H. was just picked out of thin air. But later, during an interview program, Lear says Cooper stated otherwise. I just out of the corner of my uh, ear, I heard uh, Cooper talking about O.H. Krill, and God, I turned beet red, and I grabbed him, and I walked into the living room, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, about what? And I said, O.H. Krill's a joke. We invented that for some papers. He said, no, no, I saw that in the Navy. I said, that's impossible, Bill. You couldn't have possibly seen that in the Navy. We came up with that last year, so that's, that's one. Cooper's paper states that the basics of his story have been independently verified by two sources, one of whom is Tony Pelham, reporter for the now defunct Las Vegas Bullet newspaper. I personally believe that Bill Cooper is a complete fraud and that uh, he's read a lot of UFO books and he took advantage of uh, charging 10 and $15 a person to give some lectures, which uh, a lot of people will pay to listen to. Pelham says he found bits and pieces of Cooper's background that checked out, but there was no confirmation of the big stuff. For instance, Cooper's copy of the 1972 documents. Now, Cooper explained to me that his set of documents uh, he had stored while he was living in California in a, in a garage storage area behind his home, and he said a mysterious fire destroyed them. And as a reporter at the time, I said, well, fine, just simply give me the location and the date, the address, and I'll verify with the fire department that a fire took and he became angry and said, no, I don't want to get anybody else. And I said, well, how could this hurt anyone for me to verify the date and place of a fire? Cooper insists his stories are true. Those who disagree, he says, are dupes of the secret government. Former associates like John Lear, who dare to question Cooper's material, receive unsettling messages on their answering machines. Yeah, John, uh, this is Bill Cooper. You know, I really don't know how, how to express my anger, but I'll tell you right now, I told you a long time ago, anybody that attacks me is going to get crucified. And mister, I've always been very, very kind to you, and you know it. Uh, but my patience has run out. I hope you have a good flight. 
this a prediction, but it probably won't be all that long until Eyewitness News is accused of being part of the secret government conspiracy as well because of this report. The tragedy in things like this is that well-meaning people who are genuinely curious about the topic are misled and frightened, and any hope that the topic might be given of more serious consideration is tossed right out the window. As Bill Moore put it, it plays right into the hands of those who really don't want the subject to be treated fairly. How does one tell the Indians are perhaps the least credible aspect of the ET phenomenon. The stories are so unsettling, so far outside our realm of experience that the human mind can't easily absorb them. The evidence suggests, beyond any doubt as far as I'm concerned, that uh, we're being visited by some kind of, some form of intelligence which is higher than ours, and some kind of technology which is higher than ours, and it is able to pick up human beings at will uh, as objects of study, the way we might uh, a lesser species. To admit all of those things as possibility, um, as a real possibility, is to be staggered. So we keep it at arm's length conveniently. Hopkins has done more first-hand work on abduction cases than anyone. He lectures all over the country, has written two best-selling books on the topic, created a foundation to help abductees, and has interviewed and investigated thousands of people who claim an abduction experience. There's an enormous number of people who have been through this experience. Uh, and who are having recurring abduction experiences. I don't know how it operates on the scale. I don't know how they can do it, but they're doing it. Who are the abductees? Hopkins says they come from all walks of life, and because so many say they were first abducted as children, Hopkins and others believe the victims are chosen more for genetics than anything else. A university study of 225 alleged abductees found them to be above average in intelligence, self-sufficient, honest, and generally devoid of mental disorders. Is that so? You know, I see you. I'm seeing some... I'm seeing someone there. I don't think I like this. It's going fine. Get out! It's going fine. Away! The movie Communion, like the book of the same title, is based on what writer Whitley Strieber says are real-life experiences. Strieber doesn't claim to understand the full story of what happened to him, but he insists it is real, not something he dreamed up under hypnosis. The material I was talking about, none of it is based on hypnotic regression. I have remembered pretty much everything that's happened to me at my cabin, and most of the other people have too. And most of the letters I receive are from people who have just natural memory. They haven't been undergoing hypnosis either. The experience described by many abductees is sometimes compared to rape. Hopkins once arranged for a psychologist to evaluate the case files of several alleged abductees without telling the doctor what he was looking for. And when we told her uh, that uh, these people were reporting these abduction experiences. She said, well, the, the, her test showed that there was no psychopathology present with any of these nine that would explain these accounts as some sort of psychological aberration. And she said, though it doesn't, the, uh, nothing proves that they had the experiences, she said, if they had had these experiences, these are exactly the sorts of problems you would find as with rape victims. And this is a species of rape in a certain sense. me, pushes me up and starts pounding on my back, pounding on my back. What do they want? What do you want from me? What are you doing to me? What do you want? I want to go home. Hypnotherapist Lane Keck has been contacted by dozens of alleged abductees from all over the country. While most proved to be wrong about their experiences, Keck has found two that apparently were not wrong. There's certain uh, cases that I cannot disprove. And there are some who seem to remember clearly being abducted, going aboard a mothership, and being shown different things. And of course, there's no way to prove it. But what I can say is it appears, just appears, that they have had this experience or believe that they have had it. But Hopkins says there is frequently physical evidence to substantiate these stories. Often the victims discover unexplained cuts, scoop-like scrapes or scars, as if skin samples had been taken from them. Alleged UFO landing sites are sometimes found near the spots where abductions supposedly occur. Uh, the grass is killed. Uh, it is, the soil is baked to a kind of rock-like hardness. 
and uh, we don't know what does that, but uh, there is a circle of absolutely dead grass and absolutely rock-like soil, uh, which will not then uh, support life. Uh, you can test it by taking a sample of it and then control soil from two feet outside the circle, uh, put seeds in them, water them, and so forth. You get nothing from, it's as if it's been sterilized. Now we have th something like 2,000 cases like this, and we cannot duplicate it in the uh, laboratory. We can't take some of the control soil, put it in a microwave or heat it or do anything to it to get it to this particular degree of hardness and and sterility. We don't know what the energy sources are that are causing this effect, but you have to say we have a phenomenon here that, that absolutely requires investigation. Regardless of this other evidence, the debate over abductions always seems to come back to the use of hypnosis, and with good reason. Tomorrow we'll examine some of the problems associated with hypnosis and some alternative explanations for abduction experiences. We'll also update the investigation of what some have called the abductee murder case. George Knapp, Eyewitness News 8. A group of Southern Nevadans interested in UFOs and alien abductions. In early March, the bodies of Borland and her brother were found in a Las Vegas apartment. Borland had been mutilated and set on fire. Her murder sent shockwaves through the UFO community, primarily because of what Borland claimed she knew. She would confided in letters to friends that she had an inside source involved with government testing of UFOs in Nevada. The source was someone very close to her, and according to the letters, was very upset because of Borland's involvement with the UFO contactee group. The source allegedly told Borland enough about Area S-4 to allow her to draw sketches of the alleged UFO base. When Borland was killed, her source was one of the first people questioned by police. The source is no longer a suspect. Lawmen have issued a warrant for a man believed to be in hiding in California. The murders are completely unrelated to UFOs, they say, but that assurance hasn't been good enough for Borland's UFO group. Membership has dwindled by 80%, partially because of wild stories being circulated by some UFO lecturers. I've received a lot of calls from people in the so-called UFO underground, and they're just afraid. They don't know what's going on. They're afraid to come public. Um, Stacy kind of held it together and it's changed a lot since then. Suddenly appeared. There's no explanation at all. The UFO group organized by Borland is one of dozens scattered around the country dedicated to exploring the alien phenomenon. Most members don't make claims of having had an alien contact. They're merely curious. Jeff Graff is among the curious. He says he's seen numerous UFOs over the years and decided to undergo hypnotic regression after discovering a scoop-like scar on his leg. He says the regression revealed that as a child, he'd been taken on board a spaceship. It's hard to believe, you know, and I didn't want to really believe it myself. And even after having the regressions, I've still gone back and forth as to whether I truly believe it or not. One reason for the reticence is that Graf isn't entirely sure his hypnosis sessions were objectively conducted. Psychologists and others say there are many problems with regressions, which is why even some abductees who've relied on the technique have doubts. I think that hypnosis is an inappropriate technique to use to try to find out information about this. When hypnosis was used in my case by Dr. Donald Klein, and by the way, I might say to everyone, never let yourself be hypnotized by a UFO investigator. If you want to do this, Go to a qualified, licensed therapist only. Uh, anyway, I was hypnotized by him to enable me to live through the fear, not to find out the facts. And that's what it's good for. Science has come up with several explanations why people under hypnosis claim to have been abducted by aliens. Bad dreams, wild imaginations, reactions to high stress, media brainwashing, epilepsy, and something called confabulation, in which the brain just makes up what it can't recall. Hypnotherapist Lane Keck says most of the alleged abductees that he sees are actually remembering some other traumatic or emotional experience. One of the cases I had to do with a C-section. They had a feel they had seen a movie and the abduction and the probes and all of that and they reacted strongly to that. And when they came in the office, what it turned out to be was their own birth, a tra traumatic experience, and they had a C-section. And they were lifted up and out and these memories 
really do stay with us. One of the main problems with hypnotic regressions is the hypnotherapist, Bud Hopkins says audiences and readers have filled his head with horror stories about hypnotists who are biased, untrained, or who were gouging their subjects for thousands of dollars. Often the therapist is the source of the abduction fantasy. A person under hypnosis will easily pick up what your own beliefs are and what you expect them to, to say and they will lead you consciously or unconsciously, they, they lead the witness to say certain things. And I have a lot of trouble with that. I think it is unethical, and I think it's not going to get us to the truth. Bud Hopkins, who's conducted scores of regressions, couldn't agree more. During his sessions, he purposely tries to lead his subjects away from the abduction scenario to see if they return to it on their own. But his data isn't entirely dependent on hypnosis. Between uh, 20 and 30 percent of all the cases we have, people remember them without hypnosis. Uh, some of the most famous cases. Hopkins also says the concept of media brainwashing doesn't hold water because even though most Americans are familiar with books and films about aliens and flying saucers, the same isn't true for the rest of the world. Yet, abductee reports from, say, New York are identical in detail to abductee reports from Zimbabwe. Besides, Hopkins has an ace in the hole that has not been made public. I've been collecting uh, drawings that people have made of a notational system, it would seem, numbers, letters, whatever, that they see inside UFOs uh, on a wall or a page or something. And they're virtually identical. Uh, this has never been published, obviously. They're one of my ways of being able to test the veracity of a new witness. But I've had a situation once where, uh, recently, where a woman uh, made these drawings. She had remembered what she'd seen in the UFO. She'd remembered under hypnosis and, and partially normally. Uh, made the drawings, and I was so stunned, I showed her a couple of other people's drawings, too, at that point, to show it was exactly the same. So it was the best evidence? Very with Gary, the long-awaited conclusion to the series. <laughs> Some people get very angry about this alleged cover-up stuff. They say, this is America, we have a right to know if it's true, without realizing what they may be asking to hear. Tonight, we examine a few additional UFO cases, some intriguing videotapes, and a couple of very big what-ifs. Uh, without a doubt, the, the photographic evidence in this case is by far the best documented evidence I've seen in 40 years of field investigations into the UFO phenomenon. Uh, the addition of the videotape tended to corroborate the photographic evidence uh, and vice versa. Bob Exler's reference is to a series of UFO sightings in Gulf Breeze, Florida, sightings that are among the best documented in UFO history. The Gulf Breeze incidents have been publicized on national television and in a new book. The evidence? Dozens of color photographs of odd craft, videotape of those craft, photo analysis by UFO investigators and outside experts, alleged UFO landing sites, and polygraph and psychological tests conducted on the key witnesses in the case. There are skeptics who argue that such evidence can be rigged, but what's important in this case is that more than 150 people, including public officials, also saw the same UFOs on several occasions at different locations. Coincidentally, perhaps, the reports of the UFO sightings were soon followed by the arrival of advanced military radar equipment in and around Gulf Breeze. Uh, the military interest in the Gulf Breeze cases uh, is quite an, an interesting phenomenon within it itself. Uh, they have reported at the Pensacola Naval Air Station a uh, significant amount of radar signatures involving the UFO activity there. They have de deployed uh, uh, ready alert teams, uh, the um, air and sea rescue squads and the helicopters have gone out on several occasions. None of this means diddly to science, and in a sense, how can you fault the scientists? The UFO phenomenon isn't like botany or zoology. The objects of study don't stick around for observation. They're fleeting, here one minute and gone the next. If anyone would bring in some little green men and they would run around on my conference table, I would consider that convincing. See, but uh, absent that kind of physical evidence, I remain very skeptical. Much of the evidence that does exist is of uncertain value. This videotape of objects sighted over Las Vegas is the subject of much local speculation. Some say it shows UFOs. Others think it looks like a couple of kites. At least one person insinuates it's a hoax. 
This tape, obtained from Nippon TV, shows a UFO that seems to just disappear. If it is technology, it's technology we don't have. It's small wonder that even ufologists can't agree on where the alleged aliens are from or what they might want. Jacques Vallée thinks they may be from other dimensions instead of other planets. Bud Hopkins thinks the aliens are here to interbreed with humans because their species is in trouble. Whitley Strieber says the visitors may be interested in our souls. Whether or not there really are alien visitors, evidence does exist to show our government hasn't been entirely truthful about the topic. Documents have been withheld or destroyed. Agencies have lied about their investigations. Other agencies have spied on UFO groups and researchers. Journalist Bill Moore asked the FBI for his own files. After a year of legal wrangling, the feds released only six of the 61 pages, and the six pages they did release were heavily censored. Stan Friedman had a very similar experience. Bob Lazar is still fighting to obtain his records. This reluctance by the government to even discuss UFOs became evident in our talks with an FAA employee. In the way of UFOs, I mean, people wonder why we don't pick them up on radar. I guess I have to say I'm not in a position to respond to that. <laughs> uh, you're not supposed to talk about it? That's correct. Behind the scenes, government agencies sing a different tune. This is a reproduction of a chapter from an Air Force textbook written for use by Air Force cadets. It states that UFOs have been around for thousands of years, that most reports are from reliable witnesses, that there is evidence they are of alien origin, and that the topic is worthy of in-depth study. When ufologists found out about the chapter, it was pulled from the curriculum. Why? I think, in a nutshell, that the government painted itself into a corner about UFOs for very legitimate reasons 45 years ago. And I think the paint's still wet. They don't know what to do about it. Could the government have legitimate reasons for maintaining a cover-up? Many of the same investigators who've complained loudest about it say yes. Timothy Good thinks alien technology now in the hands of the U.S. government is so potentially important to the military that it should be withheld. It was classified higher than the hydrogen bomb back in 1950. And it's still classified way, way above top secret. And that's perfectly valid in my opinion. It's rather like the, the, the hydrogen bomb. I mean, I think we're entitled to know that it's there, the effects that it has on us, but I don't think we're entitled to know how to build one. There may be other reasons for the secrecy. In 1960, NASA published a study that hypothetically pondered the effects of human contact with an alien civilization. The study concluded such contact would result in anarchy, the complete disintegration of human society, institutions, religions, governments, unless it was handled in a very gradual manner, with the public being slowly conditioned to accept it. Otherwise, panic. If you go on the air and say, the age of the world is over, tomorrow we die, I, I suppose so, but I think that the government's too smart to do that. I think it has to be done properly. What is the proper way? How does a president tell the public the government's been lying all these years, that beings from beyond are really here? The difficulty of such a pronouncement may itself be a reason for non-disclosure. What politician in his right mind would want to get up in front of a national press conference and say, My fellow Americans, I come to you uh, before you tonight with an announcement of great importance. Despite all our denials, flying saucers do in fact exist. We don't really know what their intentions are. We don't really know whether they're going to be friendly or not. They can fly circles around the best aircraft we have in flight. We are unable, unable to duplicate any of the metals found on the several craft we have recovered, nor are we able to figure out how they are propelled. We do know they can paralyze anybody they want to at will, take them into their craft. We do not know if they represent a threat, but we know that they're here and there isn't a damn thing we can do about it. We uh, have really nothing positive to say about that. Thank you and good night. One other note. In our reports about Bob Lazar, we told you he worked on flying saucers at an area called S-4 and that federal agents had done a background investigation on him for his clearance. One of those agents was named Mike Thigpen. Thigpen is not an FBI agent, as we reported, but according to informed sources, he does work for something called the Office of Federal Investigations, which does most of the security clearance work for the test site. The OFI is not listed in the phone book. The Department of Energy spokesperson we spoke with didn't have a number for them either, nor did OFI's Washington office. Yet the OFI is real, and it's here. We just can't find it to confirm if a Mike Thigpen works there or if anyone else at OFI might have investigated Bob Lazar. 
but we're going to keep trying. What about people, a lot of people have been calling and asking for information on all this story. A lot of people have been calling. We uh, have prepared a free handout uh, with a lot of names and numbers and addresses where people can write for information and tapes and books and things like that, other material. Just write to us here at the, at the station, uh, KLAS TV, Post Office Box 15047, or if you can't write this down, the, uh, the address is in the phone book, and send a self-addressed stamped envelope, and we will get something out to you in the mail in a couple of weeks. You went into this believing that that UFOs exist. Well, I, I went into it wanting to know, I'll yeah. say that. Have your feelings changed? What have you come away with now after a year of working on this? As you might have picked up from that, that piece, I, I think I'm a little more sympathetic to the government's position. I mean, some of the mater material that we have seen in the course of this investigation, I think would be very unsettling and upsetting to the public. Uh, it's like one Air, Air Force officer put it, too, the same Air Force officer who for a while was in charge of, uh, of the Project Blue Book. He said, our job in the Air Force is to identify, intercept, and destroy aircraft and unidentified aircraft over the United States. Now, we can't identify these things, we can't intercept them, and we certainly can't destroy them, so really, this is a job for science, not for the military. I think uh, what we can say about this is there is a body of information, there is some kind of a phenomenon here that can't just be written off. The government is sitting on a certain amount of information that it isn't letting us know about. And I don't think the topic has been fairly treated by science or journalism. It would be interesting if we could have a much larger investigation yeah. by someone else. Mm -hmm. A lot of interest there. Thanks, Thank you, George. George.